Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land, how are you? I hope that life is dusting you with wonderment and daydreams and with a splash of awe at this amazing planet that we live on. In this episode, uh, I want to take a bit of a deep dive into the most wonderful classic, Bleak House by Charles Dickens. I've been promising to do a deeper review on this book for quite some time and finally I'm getting around to doing it. So, there will be spoilers in this video, however you may want to listen to it before you read it anyway to look out for some deeper meanings that you'll find in this book or come back to it after you've read it. If you want to know why you should read it without spoilers, check out my other video, 100 Books You Must Read, Bleak House. So, without further ado, let's get stuck in to this masterpiece, shall we? Now, though I may say we're going to take an in-depth review of this book, it weighs in at around 750 to 800 pages in length. So, obviously, I can't cover every single aspect of the book and every different avenue of thought and theme and motif. But reading through this book, I went into it with absolutely no objective in mind. I, I do not read books approaching them with some kind of criticism. I never approach a book, say, looking at it from a Marxist lens um, or whatever lens you want to take a look at something. I just like to stand within a book and let it talk to me, feed me. And that's why I was surprised with this book, because something came out of it which I thoroughly did not expect. So let's just take a look at what the book's about very quickly. The book starts by introducing us to a case in Chancery Court called Jarndyce and Jarndyce. Now, deliberately called Jarndyce because it sounds like jaundice. This is Dickens' way of criticising the courts of the day, which are jaundice. They poison, they suck dry, they take out the spirit of people. Because this case, Jarndyce and Jarndyce, is of a huge estate, which should bequeath someone like millions, millions of pounds. But it's been dragging on for years and years and years. And, of course, the court case is consuming the money from the estate uh, to pay for itself. And now we're introduced, after a bunch of claimants have tried, they've come and gone and not got satisfied with the case, we've got two new claimants. That's Richard Carston and Ada Clare. And they come along and they've got like a guardian governess called um, Esther Summerson. So we're introduced to them. And ostensibly, we're sort of following whether they can claim this estate and how the estate has an effect on them. Amongst all this time, we have a guy called Captain Nemo who lives above a pawnbroker's shop and the pawnbroker is called Crook, which is a great name. Uh, Crook meaning criminal. And he dies right early on. That's not really a spoiler. Nemo dies and he's left some letters which we don't know at the beginning, but they, were, they have some bearing on the case um, in, in Jarndyce and Jarndyce. Now, aside from all this, we're introduced to more characters. So you have um, a woman called Lady Deadlock, who is part of the aristocracy. She is the height of fashion. You know, wherever she goes, that's where everyone else wants to be. And she's got this maid called Hortense, or Hortense, um, that's the best I can do in French, um, who follows her around. And then you've got her husband, Sir Lester Deadlock. And you see how the, the, the aristocratic way of life is stultifying, boring, but they want to hold on to their prestige and their power and all that kind of stuff. But she gets drawn in to the whole plot. And you think, how is she connected? And loads of other characters get drawn into the plot. And there's a whole swirl. In fact, there's even a detective turns up. But what strikes me most about this book is that although on the face of it, Dickens is doing his usual social commentary and criticising the law courts because they don't provide justice for people. They overlook and stamp upon the most oppressed of people, the poor and the lowly. Yes, he takes aim at that, but there's something in the background which I couldn't help but notice, it was sort of a seed of an idea when I started, just something I read, and then it began to grow. And I'm going to talk to you about that, because despite the fact this is a massive book, 
It's two bit part players who are the main characters. If you just followed the story for a story's sake, these two characters are not the main characters. But if you think carefully about it, you will realize there are two characters who don't feature a great deal, who definitely are at the crux of the whole book. And it's through these two characters, who I'm going to mention in a minute, building up the suspense, um, keep you on tender hooks. Um, it's through these two characters that you suspect that Charles Dickens is worried about the possibility of a revolution in Britain. Now, revolution does not occur in this. But the spectre of the French Revolution seems to haunt the pages of this book. And yet no reference is made to the French Revolution. So why do I say that that's the case? Well, let me tell you. The two characters that I feel are the most important characters in this book to sort of unlock the idea in Dickens' mind, which may have been brewing at the back, back of his mind, are Joe, the little orphan street sweeper, who talks to many of the characters, but he's just on the fringes. He just happens to be passing their life at the time. They happen to be crossing the section of road which he keeps clean. And the other is Tulkinghorn, that grim menace of a lawyer who, you know, he's long, tall, thin, gaunt, and silent, and he's this reservoir of all the aristocrats' secrets and whatnot. They don't feature prominently, and yet everything revolves upon them. I mean, everything revolves upon them. Joe, for instance, is this street sweeper. Now, Joe is an orphan, he's homeless, and back in 18th century London, one of the ways they would let these street urchins make a living honestly was to give them a section of road which they could keep clean. And as they swept it, people who were passing by in the traffic or wanted to cross the road, they might give him a tip because it's not a filthy area. Um, if he saw someone who is uh, an aristocratic lady, he might step out in front of all the horses and carriages and help her get safely across the road with the hope that she would give him a tip at the end of it. But poor old Joe is so beaten and oppressed, you know, he's shivered from one place to another when the police suspect him of being criminal, loitering with intent. He's shifted on and on from um, doorway to doorway, trying to catch some rest at night, but he keeps getting woken up and moved again. And um, this is a very sad tale. It's typical of Dickens, who always has his eye out for the children of London and the plight that they go through because they don't have a voice. And they should have a voice. The, the, the irony, you could say, about Joe is that he is destitute and ends up dying in poverty with no parents to succour him when he's on the street next to Chancery Court. The law. And yet the law overlooks this little lad in need. He spends a little bit of time in a slum, which is important, called Tom All Alone. And that's the name of this group of sort of grim, dank houses which are clustered together with sort of the miasma of pestilence gathered around the bottom. So that's Joe. And all of the characters cross his path. And yet he himself doesn't have a story other than he's brutally treated and ends up dying. Tulkinghorn, he knows or he finds out that Lady Dedlock has a secret. Now he's this repository of information on the aristocracy and he wants to know what Lady Dedlock's secret is. Now Talking Horn finds out that Lady Dedlock has a secret because of something Joe says. Joe says that he helped this woman who was clearly a lady, very feminine hands, she, he helped her across the road but she was dressed in a maid's outfit and he thought it was strange. And she wanted to know about a particular graveyard, which is where poor and forgotten people are buried. Now, Talking Horn hears this and he thinks, hang on, why would she be interested in some person buried at a pauper's graveyard? And he begins to dig. Now, you don't follow his digging, as it were. You just know that he's this menace. And when he sees Lady Dedlock, he frequently visits their estate, She's unnerved by him. He looks at her as if 
he knows. I know you have a secret and I will get it out of you. The other thing about Talking Horn is he appears at a number of the, the do's, the get-togethers that the aristocrats have, but they don't talk to him because he's beneath their station. He looks upon their luxury, he looks upon their world, and you can't help but sense envy. He's just there watching, almost greedy that he would like to be as powerful as them. In fact, in some ways, he is greater than them. He's more intelligent than them. He knows all their dark secrets, but he can never enter their circle. Between these two characters, we get the threat of the French Revolution. The, the worry in Dickens' mind, as far as I could see, it's just an idea that grew on me during reading the book, that Dickens was worried that the state of the poor, the abuse of the systems, could lead to a revolt to turn over the aristocracy of Britain, which could obviously, the French Revolution led to terror. And Dickens didn't want that, that unseemly anarchy in the streets, the Madame Guillotine uh, chopping heads off left, right and centre and consuming everyone in its rage, its anger and its fury. Why do I say that? Well, it's because of something that's said about Talking Horn's office. We get introduced to Talking Horn, this lawyer, and in his office it's very constantly pointed out by Dickens that there is this painted character on the ceiling or on the wall um, and it's allegory. That's who it is. It's allegory personified. And he's leaning forward, pointing. OK, so pointing into the story. So that's a not not very subtle way of Dickens saying this book is not just an attack on the court. It is an allegory. Now, an allegory is a story with a hidden meaning, normally a moral or political one. And this is where we come back to the idea of revolution in Britain, similar to that of France. Allegory is always pointing into Talking Horn's office. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, let me just read you a snippet about Talking Horn's desk. Like as he is to look at, so is his apartment in the dusk of the present afternoon. Rusty, out of date, withdrawing from attention, able to afford it. The titles on the backs of his books have retired into the binding. Everything that can have a lock has got one. No key is visible. Very few loose papers are about. He has some manuscript near him, but is not referring to it. With the round top of an inkstand and two broken bits of sealing wax, he is silently and slowly working out whatever train of indecision is in his mind. Now the inkstand top is in the middle, now the red bit of sealing wax, now the black bit. That's not it. Mr. Talking Horn must gather them all up and begin again. Here beneath the painted ceiling, with foreshortened allegory staring down at his intrusion as if it meant to swoop upon him and he could to get dead, Mr. Talking Horn has at once his house and office. Mr. Talking Horn is not in a common way. He wants no clerks. He is a great reservoir of confidences not to be so tapped. His clients want him. He is all in all. The red bit, the black bit, the inkstand top, the other inkstand top, the little sandbox. So, you to the middle, you to the right, you to the left. This train of indecision must surely be worked out now or never. Now, I grant you that was... Um, a lengthy bit of reading, but it's all very important. We see Talking Horn pointed at by allegory, so this is something about him. It's no accident allegory is in the lawyer's office. And he's playing with an inkstand, and did you notice two bits of sealing wax? And this, these bits of sealing wax are mentioned repeatedly through the book, this incidental remark. It's the colour that strikes you about them. They are red and black. What's the significance? Well, yes, they are actually used in the legal trade of the day. But it brings to mind Stendhal's great work of realist literature, The Scarlet and Black, or The Red and the Black, in which Stendhal takes a look at French society you know, a little over 30 years after the, the revolution had happened in France. And what did the red and black stand for? Well, in some respects, it stood for the clerical and the aristocratic, the black, compared to the revolutionary up-and-coming 
peasants with their Phrygian caps, you know, the, the, the sort of the cocked hat with the cockade on, on the front of it, um, which was red. So the revolutionaries versus the standard order, but it can mean a lot of other things. There's powerful symbolism in the red and the black. It could be the dark of ages past to the world about to dawn, as Herbert Kreitzmer would say. Um, there's many different ways of looking at it. It could be the blood to be spilled. It could be the black of death. It could be hope for a burning future because Julian Sorrell in The Scarlet and Black sits in the church and there's this gleam off the red curtains, which seems a great hope, but it all ends in Julian Sorrell's death at the end. I think Dickens is referring to The Scarlet and Black by Stendhal, which gives us a link to France again, to do with something about the revolution, the discontent between the classes. On top of that, Tolkien Horn, listen to this, it says, here in a large house, formerly a house of state, lives Mr. Tolkienhorn. So Tolkienhorn, the lawyer, who likes to have the secrets of the aristocracy, who would like to be amongst them, but is beneath them, where does he live? He lives in a former house of state. He has aspirations to be in high society. Now, why is that important? It's all to do with the French Revolution again. In the French Revolution, um, just before it broke out, you had a treaty called the Third Estate because you had the uh, Estates General in France and the two estates or the three estates were the monarchy or the aristocracy, the clergy and the people. But the people didn't really have any representation. Yet the Third Estate, the common people, was 90% of the population. And there was an argument that they needed to be represented, they needed to be able to defend themselves at law, all these kind of things. And the third estate is what throws over the government. It's, it's the uprising of the common man, the sans culotte, the, the um, what's it called, the no breeches. They didn't wear the aristocratic breeches from the knee down. They wore sort of baggy trousers, typically poor. What's amazing about these, this third estate, is to get their power, Edmund Burke in 1790 made an unusual observation, no, not unusual, a pertinent observation. He said, what surprises me about the representation of the third estate is that they're nearly all lawyers. When the Republic started the revolution, amongst, was it 660, um, judiciary seats, sort of seats within the provinces, 400 positions were taken up by lawyers. The French Revolution really was a revolution of lawyers. And Dickens knows this. The lawyers realised they were the ones that could put the rhetoric, the spin, they could build um, an ideology which others could stand behind. They could be the voice of the people, but to what end? It made them tip over the aristocracy and set themselves up in power. They were no longer a low-level bourgeoisie. They were right at the top. Interestingly, American Revolution II, to gain its voice, it was a bunch of lawyers that managed to put the words to the revolution which people could get behind the cause. Now, think of the main characters in the French Revolution. Who have you got? Probably the most famous, Maximilien Robespierre was one of them. Then you had the very famous and eloquent Georges Danton. You had um, Fouquet Tonville. You had Desmoulins, um, a very strong supporter of the sans culotte. So the thing they all have in common is they are all lawyers. Talking horn is this menace in the background that has all the secrets on the aristocracy. He wants to get to the aristocracy. And it's not just talking horn. You have other characters like Conversation Kenge. He's pretty okay, but he's trying to make his way up the social ladder by using the law. You have Chancery Court, which needs to be adjusted, which Dickens is making a plea for in Bleak House. But, of course, Dickens knew the law courts very well, being a journalist early on in his career. So he knew the sort of grasping, climbing ways of the clerks and the lawyers in there, that they didn't necessarily want justice for people. They wanted to advance their own agendas and to grow. And there is a warning in this book, through Talking Hall mainly, 
that Dickens senses the lawyers are trying to gain their power. They're getting a stranglehold on society. The people are turning to the lawyers to get help. But if the lawyers have a sinister motive in doing this, if, you know, they're, they're full of perfidy and untruth, then where could that lead? Especially if they're envious of the aristocracy and they want to throw them over. Now that was Tulkinghorn. I just want to step across to the other character now, the orphan street sweeper, Joe. Joe is the oppressed, isn't he? Um, he's, he hasn't got a place to stay. He can barely get food to eat. He barely has enough money. But he does no wrong, but he's horribly oppressed. There's an incident in the book which Dickens uses where he compares Joe and by extension, all of the very lowly and oppressed, which in France were the sans culotte. He compares Joe to animals. Just listen to this. He goes to his crossing where he cleans and begins to lay it out for the day. The town awakes. The great teetotum is set up for its daily spin and whirl. All that unaccountable reading and writing, which has been suspended for a few hours in sleep, recommences. Joe and the other lower animals get on in the unintelligible mess as they can. It's market day. The blinded oxen, overgoaded, overdriven, never guided, run into wrong places and are beaten out, and plunge red-eyed and foaming at stone walls, and often sorely hurt the innocent, and often sorely hurt themselves. Very like Joe and his order. Very, very like. But it goes further. Then a band comes and starts playing music and Joe stands listening to it, but so does a drover's dog, so like a sheepdog. And there's a comparison between the two. It says, a thoroughly vagabond dog accustomed to low company in public houses, a terrific dog to sheep, ready at a whistle to scamper over their backs and tear out mouthfuls of their wool but an educated, improved, developed dog who has been taught his duties and knows how to discharge them. He and Joe listen to the music, probably with much the same amount of animal satisfaction. Likewise, as to awakened association, aspiration or regret, melancholy or cheerful reference to things beyond the senses, they are probably upon a par. But otherwise, how far above the human listener is the brute? Turn that dog's descendants wild like Joe, and in a very few years they will so degenerate that they will lose even their bark, but not their bite. This sums up the situation in France before the revolution. The lower animals, that is, the peasantry of France, were subjugated. They had lost their bark. They were quiet. You read Tale of Two Cities by Dickens as murmurings in the back alleyways. They talk in code because no one wants to speak up for fear of being punished by the aristocracy. But what had they not lost? Their bite. And Dickens says, so like Joe, if you turn him wild in a few years, he will have his bite. In other words, the masses will rise and demand some restoration of justice, some changing of the whole system. And one feels that Dickens is scared that revolution may be necessary. He was a reformer after all, but not a revolution like France, which was so bloody and all consuming in its murderous might. And that's what Dickens seems to be getting at through these characters. Remember, he quite explicitly has said that the story is an allegory. And this is linked to the lawyers, because did you notice that Joe linked to the dog, the dog was educated enough to chase after sheep and it would jump on their backs and tear out wool with its mouth. Well, the lawyers were giving a voice to people. They could create a system which could speak for the people, but really advance the agendas of the lawyers, just like Robespierre became top of France. Um, did he really love the people? He said he fought for the people but he proved to be a tyrant. But they did his bidding. They chased after any who wouldn't follow the pack. Now, isn't that a fascinating take on a book? On the one hand, we have this brilliant criticism of Chancery Court and 
uh, a great story, but there is this hidden allegory behind it all that Dickens senses we must reform things before revolution is forced upon us. Those in power need to do something before they are forced to do something and lose their lives if, it, if France was anything to go by. There is another facet which comes into play in this book which fits very well with the idea of a revolution, a brewing storm in society, and where it comes from, and how lawyers manipulate it. And that's Richard Carston. You know, he's the one who has got a claim on the Jarndyce and Jarndyce case. Now, he gets sucked into this case because he's determined to win it, and he really hopes, he's pinning all his hopes on becoming rich and wealthy. But actually, what it does is it bleeds him dry. Um, it, it, it sort of makes him sick to the point of death. But why does he get drawn into it? So Dickens makes this really interesting observation, just a very short sentence about Richard Carston. In fact, it comes out of Carston's mouth. John Jarndyce, someone who's been involved in the case but will have nothing to do with it because he sees it ruining so many others, has warned Richard, have nothing to do with it. Stop putting your hopes in this case. You will not get what you want out of it. It will bleed you dry. But Richard, younger and hot-headed, disagrees, and he simply says, whether it pleases him or displeases him, that's John Jarndyce, I must maintain my rights and aiders. I have been thinking about it a good deal, and this is the conclusion I have come to. This phrase, I must maintain my rights. Demanding one's rights seems so basic to our nature justice. But it is the root of a lot of trouble. Sometimes one needs to be wronged. Sometimes one needs to be patient and not demand one's rights, but slowly work it out. In fact, hastiness is Richard Carston's undoing. He can't settle down to any, any profession to make money because he just wants to get those riches and he won't need to have a profession. I must maintain my rights. Now, this was pretty much the uh, mot juste of the French Revolution, the rights of the common man. Now, it sounds right, doesn't it? But instead of a patient process, what happened was this sudden swell led by the lawyers who gave great rhetoric and pathos, so using the emotions to drive the people. You think of Desmoulins, who jumps on the cafe table and speaks to the, the peasantry of France and says, let's, you know, let's take up arms. And they grab arms and, and they run to the Bastille and really that kicks off the whole French Revolution. You know, it was, it was this visceral, emotional reaction. It's the rights of the people. And the lawyers, we are representing the rights of the people. We speak for the people. Dickens sees this as a problem. Demanding one's rights, being in a haste, to get one's rights. However, you can't blame them when they're pushed down, pushed down. The problem with Carston is he's trying to get his justice through the law courts which are corrupt. He can't see that the lawyers do not have his best interests at heart. It is not the way to go, which is the way the French went to the French Revolution, led by the lawyers. Listen to what Dickens says about Chancery Court. The one great principle of the English law is to make business for itself. There is no other principle distinctly, certainly, and consistently maintained through all its narrow turnings. Viewed by this light, it becomes a coherent scheme, and not the monstrous make the laity are apt to think it. Let them but once clearly perceive that its grand principle is to make business for itself at their expense, and surely they will cease to grumble. And when he says cease to grumble, he doesn't mean they won't feel discontent. It just means they'll stop grumbling about the law when they realise it's out to make money for those who are in it. The lawyers are supposed to make money. Isn't that a profound observation? In fact, how profound that it continues to be the case even today. The systems of authority are set up to perpetuate the authority of those in them to keep their power. The lawyers are serving their own ends, is what Dickens was saying. Now, sure, there are good lawyers, but as a body, Dickens being at the law court so often through his life, he knew full well 
that the lawyers were merely trying to climb the social order and they were reaching a ceiling and they were stopped by the aristocracy. As a voice of the people, could they perhaps lead a revolution like in France, using the downtrodden in order to get their power? Because Tolkienhorn knows about Joe, the little street urchin, yet he does nothing in his power to help him. Chancery Court is just a stone's throw from Joe, someone who needs help, but they won't help him. The police officers see a little bundle of rags sleeping in a shop doorway, and instead of feeling pity, they raise him up and tell him to move on. How is that justice? It's not. And if it's not dealt with at some point, it's going to build to a pitch where the poor can't take it anymore. Yes, they may have lost their bark, like the dog, but give them a few years in the wild and they will not have lost their bite. And that's why Dickens is saying the, the powers that be in Britain need to start looking at the poor and rendering true justice, starting to help them out. You see, one of the criticisms in this book is there are a lot of Christian missionary expeditions to um, the colonies to help the plight of those over there and to help the slaves in the Caribbean. But Dickens was saying, what about the poor oppressed right here at home? And he uses the slum of Tom All Alone that I mentioned before. If you've read this, you'll know what I'm talking about. He makes a comment about Tom All Alone and how the government view it. And it says this, so Tom All Alone stands for the poor condition of the lower classes. It says, Tom, that's Tom all alone, the slums, only may and can or shall and will be reclaimed according to somebody's theory, but nobody's practice. So what Dickens is saying is government talk about helping the lowly, but they never do anything about it. And if they don't, you better be careful. A very significant event happens in the book when Tolkienhorn is murdered. And when he's murdered, it's murdered in his office and Dickens doesn't fail to point out allegory, that painting on the ceiling, who is pointing exactly at where Tolkienhorn lies dead. Now, what's the significance of this if the French Revolution is what is haunting the scene. The, if, if the French Revolution is the allegory behind this book, what's the meaning of allegory pointing at Tolkienhorn? Think about Maximilian Robespierre. He was the powerful lawyer who got to the top um, during the revolution. And you think of Danton as well. And I think Desmoulins was, was also amongst this, this group. They all got eaten by the revolution. Robespierre was beheaded. So was Danton. So the lawyers actually created something which consumed themselves. Now, Tolkienhorn dies. Is there a reason that I personally come to this conclusion? There's just one little detail which makes me think it. It's who killed Tolkienhorn. It was none other than Hortense, Lady Dedlock's maid, the only French character in the whole book. Talkinghorn was murdered. Talkinghorn the lawyer was murdered by a French maid. The peasants had eaten those who had stirred them up. I really think this is what Dickens is saying. He may even be sending a message to the lawyers. Not just Chancery Court has to change because it's ridiculous how it's set up. It just bleeds people dry. But you lawyers, you think you're getting somewhere your time is limited. People will eventually get tired of you and push back, just like they did in France. So that's one of the chief messages that I find in this book. That is what I think is the allegory behind this book. And that is why classic literature is so brilliant. The whole book itself has nothing to do with the French Revolution in its story. And yet, the French Revolution seems to be a subwritten text. It's almost like when you played a record backwards and it had a hidden message. It's that. Summing up his book, Dickens puts these words in John Jarndyce's mouth. Remember, John Jarndyce is the one who doesn't want to go near the Jarndyce and Jarndyce case. He doesn't want to go near the law courts to put his faith in the lawyers because he knows 
they only serve themselves. Listen to what he says about the English system. And it's a warning that things need to change. What shall we find reasonable in jaundice and jaundice? Unreason and injustice at the top. Unreason and injustice at the heart and at the bottom. Unreason and injustice from beginning to end, if it ever has an end. How should poor Rick, always hovering near it, pluck reason out of it? He no more gathers grapes from thorns or figs from thistles than older men did in old times. What's so beautiful about that is Dickens is saying, why should anyone put faith in the legal system? It doesn't work. And that needs to be remedied. People need to stop looking at it for a quick fix, because that's what Rick was doing, a quick fix. He didn't want a profession, he wanted to get the money. People want their rights, and so they'll just listen to some ideology and follow it. No, don't do that. It serves themselves. It is unreason and injustice from top to bottom, beginning to end, if it ever has an end. And proving it may not have an end, he talks about picking grapes from thorns, fig, figs from thistles, like the older men did in old times. So it's a phrase from the Bible. So he's saying injustice and unreason in rulership has gone back to the ancients. Nothing has ever changed. Do not look to the system to fix matters. Now, this is an acute observation by probably one of the greatest social observers and critics of all time. It could be summed up probably in a scripture, a famous scripture um, in the book of Jeremiah, where it says, I well know that it does not belong to man who is walking even to direct his step. That was my view of the book Bleak House by Charles Dickens. There are lots of other avenues you could go down and different motifs you could explore. But as I read this, and I went in with no agenda, I had, I had no idea of the French Revolution being linked to this. It was a seed that started when it was allegory pointing at talking horn. Why a lawyer? Why the red and the black wax? Why was the lawyer killed by a French woman? The lawyer was the only link between the elite world of Lady Dedlock and the lowly world of the poor and oppressed Tom, uh, Joe. Just like the lawyers were betwixt and between the first and second estate and the third estate of France. They were the connection. And there's a comment made here how cu in, in Bleak House, how curious that these two worlds so different find themselves regularly coming together or into contact, um, almost by chance. So that's what I thought of Bleak House. What do you think? What did you think of the book itself? Leave your comments down below. What did you think of this review? Does it make you want to go and read it? But also, can I just point out that this is why great literature is worth reading. Stop and think about a book. Use a pen as you go along. Because as you jot your ideas down, they begin to formulate and you begin to spot things in books beyond the story. You begin to sense that you're, you're discoursing with the mind that wrote it. So, until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.